Well, welcome back to our study through the book of Hebrews. My name is Garrett, and we are thrilled to have you joining us this summer as we're digging into the Word of God and, and diving a little bit deeper. And, and you may have thought, what did I get myself into as we've been going through these teaching videos the last couple weeks? Because we have been getting a little deeper into the book and into Scripture than, than you might be used to. And that's a good thing. We, we need to stretch ourselves when reading Scripture. And when we don't dive into the context, and really for any book, but especially the book of Hebrews, if we're not reading the Old Testament, or holding it in one hand while reading the New Testament in the other hand, we're missing a lot. Because you got to keep in mind, when in the New Testament, the scriptures are referencing, are being referenced, those authors are originally meaning the Old Testament. So the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, are vitally important to our understanding of the New Testament. And that is especially true in the book of Hebrews, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, and as we will continue to see today. Today we're looking at Hebrews 3, 1, verse it, or to chapter 4, verse 13. And there's two major themes from the Old Testament that we're looking at. And that is Moses and the, the person of Moses and the, the historic nature and, and the high view of Moses by Israel and the promised land. And we're looking at those two themes in order to have an understanding of what the teacher in the book of Hebrews is really digging into in this text. So, diving right in here to Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verses 5 through 6, what we see the author emphasizing is that he Moses, while he is great and as he is regarded as great, he is, in many ways, the the originator of the nation of Israel. The law of Moses came through him. He pulled Israel out of Exodus. The nation of Israel was established under his leadership. He's the great prophet that communicated between Yahweh and his people. But in all of that, what we see established by this likely Jewish Christian was that Moses was a faithful was faithful as a servant in all of God's household. But Christ was faithful as a son. And you're setting, there's this big separation now between son and servant. In the ancient world, the son of a household held the same authority as the Lord, the, the father of that household. In the same way that the head of that household, the father, would have dominion over the servants, over managing the estate and things like that. The son, the firstborn son, had just as much authority, just as much say. And what the author of Hebrews is establishing here is Moses isn't the son of God. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus has the ultimate authority. Moses is just a servant in the household. Jesus is commands Moses as much as God commands Moses, and therefore we that we are that household. He, he's saying we are the church. We, As the church, we are the family of God. We exist in the household of God, and we hold our confidence not in Moses, but in the Son. It's in his hope that we boast. Now, this kind of sets the stage for, for what Jesus is, or what the author of Hebrews is about to get into here, that Jesus is superior to Moses. And last week we covered that Jesus is superior to any messenger of God, even the uh, supernatural messengers of God that we call angels. And here he's establishing that he's greater than Moses, the messenger of God that established Israel. Jesus is the son, Moses is just a servant. Now, one of the, he, the, the teacher of Hebrews builds off of this emphasis of Moses, and he kind of recounts some of the history of Egypt. And he talks about how Israel rebelled, they heard about who God was, and, and they rebelled 
coming out of Egypt. They came out of Egypt under the servant Moses, who is regarded as great and and the the pinnacle of Israel's leadership. And yet, when they came out of Egypt, they had already rebelled. It didn't take long for them to come out of Egypt and turn on God's servant Moses, and God was angry for 40 years. Now, the reason that the author of Hebrews is bringing this up, that what he's saying is we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And that's where we start to see this shift from the theme of Moses into the theme of the promised land. Because if you remember, what was it about Moses that was key in leaving Egypt? What, what did Moses go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go? Okay, well, go where? Was Moses wanting to bring Israel out of Egypt and just into the wilderness? No, what he was saying is, I'm bringing you out of Egypt into the land God has promised you. I'm bringing you from Egypt into something better. I'm bringing you from where you're not a people into being God's people in his promised land, in his, more than that, promised rest. You know, the, the promised land wasn't just simply a land flowing with milk and honey. It was that, but the emphasis of the land flowing with milk and honey surrounded Rest, surrounded Sabbath, surrounded entering into God's peace. And what happened with Israel? And if you remember the history of Exodus, they rebelled against God, so to speak. They, God pulled them out of Egypt and they became an obstinate and stiff-necked people. They doubted God everywhere they went. They refused to not worship idols, even though God was right there with them on the mountain, right in front of them, showing him his glory in, in the form of a great fire and wind. And yet they, they were obstinate. They were hard-headed. They refused to continue following. And he, the teacher of Hebrews is bringing this up because he's saying, look, we have just started this journey with Christ. How quickly can we become obstinate like our fellow forefathers? How quickly can we come and say, well, Jesus isn't actually God. He, you know, he was just a messenger. How quickly can we come to this point where we disregard Jesus as just another prophet like Moses and not God himself? How quickly can we become obstinate and stiff-necked like those who came before us, like those who weren't allowed to enter the promised land because of their doubt, because of their stiff neckedness, because of their unwillingness to submit and serve God and worship him only. The author, the teacher of Hebrews, he's bringing it up to make that point, likely because at this stage of the early church, there were Jewish Christians who were going around teaching that Jesus was the Messiah, but he wasn't God. You know, God is God. Jesus can't be God. He's just something more. He's just a continuation of the Old Testament. He's not God himself. And the author of Hebrews, he's pretty straightforward telling us that Jesus is God. And then he's giving this warning of, remember what happened to Israel when they were stiff-necked? Well, they didn't enter the promise. So let's ensure that we are entering that promise. And that's where you know, we continue into chapter 4, verses 1, therefore. So anytime you see a therefore, you have to remember what is it there for. So you have to think about what came before the therefore. So he's talking in this sense. Um, he's talking about uh, what came before this section. So in verse 19 of chapter 3, the teacher says, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So he's alluding to the fact that those who were under Moses, they didn't enter the promised land because they refused to submit to God. They refused to truly believe in him, even though he was right in front of them. So therefore, since the promise to enter his rest remains, let us beware that none of you be found to have fallen short. For we also have received the good news just as they did. So what he's saying is 
that just as the Israelites received this news of a promised land that they were being brought into, that Moses was through God's agency, through God's power, bringing his people out of slavery into the land that he has promised, we too have received a good news, just as they did. But the message they heard didn't benefit them since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. So what, <clears throat> what the teacher is imploring us is, let's receive this good news with an open heart. Let's let this good news transform us. Let's not become obstinate and stiff-necked and say, okay, I'll take some of it, but the rest of it I'm going to toss away because you know that's, that's hard to believe. I, I get Jesus was a good teacher. He was probably a prophet. He, he might have been even the Messiah, but he's not God. Well, then you might as well just throw the rest of it away because Jesus' entire ministry rests on the fact that he is God. Our salvation rests on the fact that he is God. We can't find the rest, the promised rest, the promised peace, our hope for eternity, unless Jesus is God. So let's ensure that we're united in that belief. And that all brings us to a very well-known passage, Hebrews 4, 11, 13. And building off of this discussion on Moses and the promised land, the, the teacher of Hebrews says, let us then. So whenever you see let us then or, you know, therefore, you need to remember what it's there for. What, when you see this let us then, it's often in terms of an application. So therefore is there to finish out what came before it to make sense of the exposition. Let us then is to apply the the exhortation to apply what he's being called he's calling us into so let us then make every effort to enter that rest so let's make sure we enter the rest that was promised for now when the four is there this is an explanation of the application so let's make every enter to enter that rest well why because for the word of God is living and effective, sharper than any double-edged sword. Now, this word here, it comes from the Greek word logos. And now that word, you might be familiar with that. John uses that in his gospel to say, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. He uses this term logos. To refer to Jesus. You know, Jesus is the Word of God. And this all ties into what's called special revelation. And special revelation is revelation that gives us special insight into God. So what does that mean? That's scripture. All of creation is general revelation. We can look into the stars and the night sky and know something greater is out there. Those things didn't just get there by accident. That's something greater. And an atheist can look into the night sky and become a theist, can become an agnostic and say there's something greater out there. But an atheist won't look into the night sky and know God personally. You can only do that through special revelation. So what is special revelation? It is scripture and it is Jesus. It is the word. Scripture and Jesus is the Logos. Our revelation of knowing God is the Word of God. And the Word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword because it penetrates our hearts. And, and we see an image of this in the book of Revelation when Jesus comes before John, right before John is revealing his revelation, and it describes a double-edged sword coming from Jesus' mouth, establishing that Jesus and the scriptures, they reveal who God is. They reveal the character of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the wrath of God, the goodness and love of God. They reveal all those things, and they penetrate our very being. They search us. Thinking about Psalm 139, where David, after talking about all these characteristics of God's omnipotence and omnipresence and omniscience, 
that he is all knowing, all powerful, and 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 all places all the time, after saying all these beautiful things about God, you know what David says next? Search me. Search me, God. See if there's an offensive way within me and lead me in the everlasting way. That's what it means for the word of God to be a double-edged sword that penetrates our hearts. And what the teacher of Hebrews is saying here is, The Israelites didn't enter the promised land because they were unwilling to let God take over them, to indwell them, to search them, to separate the unrighteous from the righteous, to penetrate their hearts. Therefore, let us not do the same. Let us make every effort to enter that rest by allowing the word of God to penetrate our hearts. Let us join with David and say, search me, God. Lead me in the everlasting way. Now, I encourage you, if you haven't already, make sure to read through this text here in Hebrews, which is Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, 13. And I would also very much encourage you to sit down and read Psalm 139. And don't just sprint through it. Read it slowly and meditatively, pour over the imagery and the statements that David is making about God, but pray along with David when he gets to the end and says, search me, God. Lead me in the everlasting way. And hopefully that sort of mentality, that realization that the word of God is a double-edged sword that penetrates our being, hopefully that brings you a hope that brings you a peace that connects you to the nature of God so that you can find fulfillment in Christ even if the world is tossing you side by side, side one way or another. We have rest in him. and He wants to enter into our very being. So let us make every effort to enter that rest. Thanks for joining us today as we've continued the study. And for next week, in preparation, if you want to read ahead of time, we'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, through chapter 6, verse 20. Hope you've been enjoying this time of study and and depth into the book of Hebrews. I know I have. And we'll see you next time as we continue. Have a good week.